All right, so let's talk about tree huggers this morning. Any tree huggers here today? Of the biblical kind? I'm really not interested in the other kind. Let's read at the top of our outlines our text that we're working from this morning. We started into this series last week, and prayerfully we're going to finish it today. When you read this text out of Isaiah 61, it was really referring to the Messiah. Of course, Jesus, when he was to come, what would kind of constitute a, a huge, the heart of his ministry, and certainly a huge portion of it. And he said, when the Messiah comes... The heart of the Lord is to bring comfort to those who mourn in Zion. Now, Zion was a hill in Jerusalem. But in terms of symbolisms and metaphors, Zion is really the church. It's the people of God. So the Lord wants to bring comfort to those who mourn that belong to him. Giving them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy in place of mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Now, how many of you know, let's go back up a little bit. The oil of joy for mourning. Have you ever been to a wedding of uh, an unsaved person where there's been all kinds of drama there? Right? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Why? Because there's utter hopelessness there. There's only loss. No, no sense of redemption. No sense of the presence of the Lord. But how many of you know that when you go to a, a, a home sending and effect of a believer, you could feel some sting because there's a loss of a person that you know and love. But man, the presence of the Lord just envelops that place. And in certain instances, it can actually turn into a real celebratory home sending. I remember being at a local funeral home one time. I was I think we, we spoke at the funeral home that night, and it was a Christian, and there was so much joy in the place that had the funeral director angry with us. This is absolutely disrespectful. Oh, what are you people doing? I said, huh? Yeah, what are they doing talking out here? What are they doing talking out here? I said, hey, look, we know where this person is. That has nothing to do with it. <laughs> so, okay, got you. Gotcha. That has nothing to do with it. So you see, there's a huge difference. And guess what? It's because the Lord brings the oil of joy in place of mourning that overtakes the mourning, overtakes the sadness, overtakes the mere sense of loss. He brings the garment of praise in place of what? A spirit of heaviness. Now, the Lord does all that for specific purposes, that you and I might be called the oak trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified through our lives. So I want you to see that the Lord comes and he does his part to make sure that no matter what comes our way in life, he is with us, he won't let us go, and he makes sure that our roots continue to go down despite the seasons and despite the storms that come our way, which is his part there, right? The oil of joy for mourning, et cetera, et cetera. His whole angle, his whole purpose and heart in the matter is that our roots continue to go down and we become oak trees, strong, healthy trees, but trees of righteousness, and that our lives symbolize and play out the planting of the Lord. That means we're not flighty jerks. That means we're committed people. Hello? That means we're committed. How many of you know that we live in a world that's absolutely uncommitted to anything except evil? They're fully committed to evil and rebellion. Fully. But to be committed to something that's good and godly is really going against the grain of the spirit of our culture, which is immensely fallen. So the Lord says, look, over against the backdrop of that nonsense, I want my people to be planted, to be bearing fruit. The season that they're going through, the season that the country is in, notwithstanding, because I'll be the source of their nutrients. 
so that their lives play out a different story than the world is playing out. They're not going down, they're going to go up. Wait, you can't do that. Yeah, the Lord says, watch me. My people will not be destroyed, they will win. They will not lose, they will win. They will not dry up and blow away. I will cause their roots to find fresh water. I'll be the source no matter what's going on. But understand that what the Lord wants out of it is to be glorified through how we live that out and live our Christian experience out. If we're not bearing the fruit, but we're calling ourselves a Christian, we're cutting across the grain of the heart of this text. So be careful. Be careful that you don't take the money and run. Be careful that you don't, you know, Job said, hey, we can't just be people that take the good things from the Lord, but when something negative comes, we curse him and die. Now, in order to be able to handle what comes our way in life, we better be rooted and planted. Our roots better go down deep. Because sometimes it's, it's, it can be easy to give up. It can be easy to be discouraged. It can be easy to say, forget it. Because life is hard. If it was hard before, it's really hard now. Man, I hope we don't see the day of $10, $10 gallon gas. It's crazy. I thought it was interesting that years ago, when I went to go uh, minister with Mike Anticoli up in Sweden, the socialist dream. And back then, the gas was $10.10 a gallon. Why? Because this notion of free is insane and it's a lie. You're going to pay all right. You don't pay coming, you're going to pay going. Don't believe this nonsense of free. If it's free to you, it just means someone else is paying for it. <laughs> Give me a break. It's a lie, and it's deceitful. So we need to hang in there because God only knows where this whole thing's going to go before it gets finally straightened up. But we better know who we are in Christ, and we better be in this deep and for the long haul. And, and realize that, hey, if I give the right way, I have a platform of belief. I have a platform of faith that's biblical, that's mine, by which I can believe God to be my source and my supplier, despite what goes on or what might go on. Are you with me? So get your head out of the sand. Let's get in the game for real. Praise God. All right, so let's go. Look at the... Roman numeral two, characteristics, the four characteristics, in fact, of healthy trees. We covered number one last week, and number one was this, that healthy trees grow a deep root system, a deep root system. I'll tell you one thing, God wants us to grow down before he wants us to grow up and out. He wants us to grow down before he allows us to grow up and out. We, we want the microwave version of everything now. Let, my, let me plug my Christianity. You know the popcorn bags you throw in the microwave? This side up. Christianity. 21st century Christianity. Boom. Popcorn. That's not the way it works. So don't go there because you're going to disappoint yourself and you can get really, really wiped out with that kind of stuff. Remember we talked about last week that shortcuts are dangerous, counterproductive, and deceptive. So don't go for the microwave. Let, let's cook a nice dinner in the oven, the old-fashioned way. All right? You remember, I'm just recapping a little bit. That there are reasons for success in life, in every capacity, and reasons for failure. There are reasons why people succeed. There are reasons why people fail. And there are reasons why people flourish in the things of God, and there are reasons why some don't. One, just one little example would be 
coming into a church that's teaching the word and it's going in one ear and out the other right now. Right now, literally, right now as I speak. What I've already said hasn't made a single ounce of impact. It, do, do this at the very least. At least stick one finger in one ear so when it goes in, it has no escape. Because <laughs> the devil's not playing games. He wants to destroy you. And he wants to wipe you out. So be careful. All right, here we go. Number two. The second characteristic of healthy trees is this. Healthy, healthy trees grow wide as well as tall. You say, well, I'm pretty wide now. No, that's not what I mean. You look just fine. <laughs> healthy trees grow wide as well as tall. Look at the scripture here, right under point two. Jesus giving a parable. <clears throat> it says, another parable Jesus put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed which a man took and he sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. It's the smallest of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Isn't that a beautiful depiction of what our lives should look like and produce? You see, the long, the long and short of it is this. You don't have to start out big to become big. Number two is when our lives come into the fullness of what they're supposed to be, it actually provides shelter and shade for other people to come from the heat of the day that's going on in this world. That being around us, they feel a little bit better. That we're hope givers, just like if you found a tree. And you're boiling like on a day like this and you find a nice tree. You run underneath it. Even if you can't stay there, you do it temporarily. How about going through a desert and you see an oasis? Man, you're just hoping it's not a mirage. And then you go up. <laughs> Water. <sighs> it doesn't even matter if it's salty. It would be a great disappointment because you can't drink that. But at least it would be water. At least it would give some level of refreshing than just a baking of the sun. But guess what? We're supposed to be a genuine oasis for some others. We're supposed to be a tree. You start out small. Maybe some of you right now in your Christianity, you're thinking, man, I can't believe. Now, well, this is not being prideful. Man, I can't believe where I am in the Lord now and where he's brought me. Because I remember well where my life was, where my life was before I met Christ. And if that doesn't convince you, I want you to just take a few moments and go before the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, show me where my life might have been, might have wound up. Because our memories can grow very short. We can get very myopic, as Peter said in 2 Peter 1. We can get very short-sighted. And after we get used to the things of God for a while, we forget where we've come from or where we could have wound up. That's why Peter said, you read it, 2 Peter 1, verses 3 to 12. He said, because those who don't continue to grow, 2 Peter 1, 3 to 12, he said, are short-sighted, forgetting where they've come from. Thinking that, well, I've grown from here to there, Good enough is good enough. Yeah, we'll explain that to Jesus. But Jesus said, look, you can start out small, insignificant. But when I'm done with you, the smallest seed becomes that which gives hope and covering and shade. And the birds of the air come and have a place to nest in its branches. See, healthy trees... They grow wide as well as tall. I was thinking about this and I saw a picture of a sequoia tree in California. You see those sequoia trees? Unbelievable. When we were out there, we tried to get to go see them, but we only had limited time and we couldn't make it up there. But understand with me that some of the largest sequoia trees are five stories taller than the Statue of Liberty. 
five stories taller than the Statue of Liberty. A tree. Now, you want to know the key to the sequoias growing the way they grow? Their DNA notwithstanding? It says they never grow alone. There's always groves of sequoia trees. And our, I was, did, did some research on that basis, and I want to share with you a few facts that I uncovered. That tr trees actually share vital nutrients. They share. They share nutrients, minerals, sugars, and water via underground root exchange, exchanges. This can happen in two ways, both equally amazing. One method is called fungal hyphae. Long, thin strands of fungus grow around and between the tree roots. Some of these things have actually been known to stretch for miles. The fungus will drill into the roots of the trees and thus become a means by which substances can be exchanged and shared between trees. Another way that experts say this happens is called root grafting. This is a process in which roots of different trees grow in the same area. They overlap during the course of their growth and physically actually fuse together and become one tree. Trees of different species are even capable of fusing their roots together and turning the combined root structures into one massive underground circulatory and sharing system. So that's pretty amazing, huh? seeing how trees actually share vital nutrients so they don't grow alone. Uh, now, the only downside that experts say is in this same picture is that because of their openness and connectedness, that diseases can also be passed if not careful. Now, I want you to see that as believers... We're called to grow together, not alone. We grow together best. We're a grove of faith here. We protect each other. We share with one another. But guess what? If one of us is not living right, or have messed up theology, or a rebellious attitude, or a root of bitterness, you can actually polluting, be polluting your brother or sister in Christ, or misleading them. So you need to be careful. All of us need to be careful. That's why Paul said, number one, examine yourselves. Often to see where you are in the faith. If you're in the faith, and then where you are in reference to the faith. Secondly, live an accountable, transparent life. So that if you start going off the deep end, there's someone there that can pull you back in before it's too late. Now listen to me. The reason why that's so powerful and we take these lessons from the sequoia is this. Whenever you seek to grow big and strong and tall, you also become a target. Think about it. The wind, the rain, the storms. Your branches and your leaves actually become like a sail. So you're growing big and strong and you go like this, yes! And then that wind actually tries to use your own growth against you and set you back. It uses that... Your, your own growth as a sail to try and catch the wind and topple you over and rip your roots out. I was reading about the willow tree. <clears throat> when it's attacked by a particular deadly, it's called a web worm. It actually, now listen to this, this is crazy. It actually talks to the other willow trees around it. And these other trees release more stuff called tannin around their roots so that these web worms can't penetrate the other trees. Yeah, they go on Twitter, like <laughs> Elon Musk. <laughs> then they get cut off. <laughs> but the willow trees, they actually talk. They send certain vibrations or messages. Hey, there's web worms that are getting me. And the other trees actually produce tannin that protects their root system from these very worms. 
And guess what? That's the design of the church. Is that by growing together, we can then make wise choices between having to learn everything from our own experiences or choosing to learn from the wisdom of God's Word and from the wisdom of other people's experiences because we're growing in a grove. Listen, how many of you know that it's tremendously valuable to hear from some seasoned believers? Hey, when I was your age, I thought that too. And then I got my head handed to me. So don't think it's going to work for you any better than it did for me. You better not do that. You better not go there. You better not date that person. You certainly better not marry that person. Stuff like that. Because everybody thinks they're the exception to the biblical rule. Everybody. I can marry a flat-out unbeliever and I'll convert him. I'll convert her. Sure you will. And the check's in the mail. All right. So, so we got to be careful of all this stuff, right? And so growing together protects us. And that's how we grow wide, healthy, strong, as well as tall. We can pray for each other. We can text and call each other. We can keep each other accountable because accountability is safety. Look at the scriptures under point two, the other scriptures. Paul said, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Look at the third scripture. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become something greater than we are today. What is? What, what should we grow to? The mature body of Christ. And of course, look at the last scripture, talking about those groves, trees in the groves. And all the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of the possessions was their own. In other words, they all gave glory and credit to the Lord for being the provider. So it was theirs to be sure, but they held their blessings loosely Amen. instead of with a death grip like a miser. Amen. There should be no Christian Scrooges. Let's leave that to Charles Dickens. Because to be a Christian that counts every penny in a miserly fashion is so unlike the heart of Christ, it's unbelievable. The heart of God is always give first, receive second. Luke 6.38, give and it shall be given unto you. Don't make every excuse why you can't and expect the same blessing. Can't do it. Won't, won't work. You will always stay in that orbit of struggle and trouble. Number three, healthy trees say this. My roots are right here. My roots are right here. Because planting is crucial to growth, health, and protection. But you've got to make some declarations along the way. You've got to declare some things, and some things have to become real to you. There are some people that, that are so parachurch in their thinking that they, no wonder why they can't commit to a home church. Because they're always involved with eight other churches doing eight other things. So their mentality is so parachurch that they can't even commit. Boy, that, that's kind of crazy. You know, how many of you know that a pro baseball player can't play for eight teams at once? Right? They can show up at certain events, but they've got to belong to a team. They're under contract, you know, that kind of thing. So you've got to know where you belong. You can't be, a tree doesn't tell the planter where to plant it. A tree gets planted. Look at the scripture under uh, point three. It says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon, which is another huge tree. Planted... At the beach, they'll flourish in the courts of the Kardashians. No, I'm not saying you can't go to the beach. The planting is the issue. When you're planted in the house of the Lord, you say, no, that's it. This is my home. This is my family. That's it. 
And we'll talk in point four about the disease, what I call a destination disease. But the righteous will flourish like a palm tree, grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. That's when they will flourish in the courts of our God, and not until. In old age, they will still bear fruit. Isn't that amazing? You don't stop bearing fruit. Now, maybe in the natural world, when a tree reaches a certain age, no more apples come out of it or whatever. But that's not so in the kingdom of God. How many of you know that when you're older in the kingdom of God, you have a lot to share if you've lived right, if you have something on the ball, if you have a good testimony, if you haven't done every single thing wrong, you have some things of value to share. Now, the reason why I made all those qualifying statements is not to bum you out. It's just seniority in the kingdom. It's not like a union here. Seniority in the kingdom doesn't get you higher status. Because like in, in leadership saying, it goes like this. I can have 25 years of good ministry or one good year repeated 25 times. We could have one great year of Christianity repeated 25 times or have 25 great years of Christianity. Growing, changing, expanding, spreading, experiencing new things in the Lord, bearing a new kind of fruit, moving in more gifts of the Spirit. Hello? <clears throat> Which is it going to be? We get a choice in the matter. You know that. We don't get a choice about everything in the kingdom because some is just the Lord's uh, sovereignty and His choosing. How many of you know no matter what, I could never have been a Billy Graham I don't care if I dress like him, talk like him, own the same Bible as him, and built, uh, bought a tent. I would have had a great tent, set it up, did all the advertising, and had eight people show up. I understand that. Eight persons come to my revival meetings. Does it mean the Lord doesn't care about the lost? Does it mean he doesn't care about me? No, the, the, the fact of the matter is I can't convince him to make me an evangelist. I can evangelize, and I should, every Christian should, but Billy Graham was the office of an evangelist. I can't got, put God in a headlock and say, I want to do what he did. And the Lord says, no, I've wired you up for something else, but you better find out what that is and do things every day with all your might. And then I'll make things known in due time. I mean, I admire when an evangelist does what they do. Oh, my, that's incredible. Man, they preach a message which is not all that complex because it's not meant to be complex. But the anointing, the anointing that's released, just people are crying up in the stands or wherever, you know, the, the setting, and they're coming down to this huge, huge altar. I said, this is only God can do this. And I love it. Man, I want to do that. The Lord says, don't even think about it. All right. <laughs> but when I try and think about it and then put myself in that position, I'll never convince God to bless that. He loves me too much to bless that. Because he'll never give believers that kind of leverage in the kingdom. He's the king. In fact, you know what the word Lord meant in the original language, in the original cultural understanding of the word Lord? Tyrant. It was the word despot, a tyrant. So when unbelievers would go, let's say in Corinth, pagan temples, any, any place under Roman rule, a good Roman citizen would go once a year to a pagan temple. They would pay money <clears throat> for a, uh, uh, a holy incense, in paganism that is. <clears throat> they would take it, they would throw it on an altar, a fire, while declaring Caesar is kurias. Caesar is Lord. Christians would not do that. That's why James said, <clears throat> you know, when he's talking about a spirit of deception, he said that's why no one could say that Jesus is Lord other than by the Spirit of God. Because nobody in their right mind would stick their thumb in the eye of Caesar by saying, I won't do it. Jesus is Lord. 
He's a tyrant, but he's a tyrant of holiness and righteousness. When he, yes, does he judge? Absolutely. And when he judges, he'll always be right. When somebody goes to hell, should they go there? It's because they deserve to go there. They violated the laws of God, and they don't care about making it right by coming at the foot of the cross. So when they go, they go because they deserve to go. The Lord sent a way to be saved, and they say, I don't care. I'll make my own path up the mountain. <clears throat> so his judgments are righteous altogether. That's what Psalm, I think, 19 says. In old age, they'll still bear fruit. Healthy and green, they will remain. Think about that. Healthy and green, you still remain, even when you're old, in the kingdom of God. Older, excuse me. <clears throat> because natural age has nothing to do with fruit bearing spiritually. It is not the natural world, this is the spiritual world. Even when they're old, healthy, and green, they'll remain to proclaim to the world and to younger generations, the Lord is upright. He is my rock. He's the one that's gotten me as far as I have. He's the one that will sustain me, and he's the one that will sustain you, young one. So just watch my life, and if I've paved the way, feel free to walk in it. Wow. Think about it. Planting is crucial to our growth. I'm saying it over and over again because in America, we're committed to almost nothing. You can't get people to do anything. You can't get people to serve. You can't get people to show up. Look at how many people are. We have 11 million jobs in America. Nobody wants to do anything. Can't get anybody to work. But we don't have a problem. It's all good. It's all good. 11 million unfilled jobs. I don't get it. I don't understand. I'll never understand that. See, so planting commitment is a huge issue, and it cannot infect the body of Christ. Let it infect the world. Do not ever let it infect the church. Why? Because remember the trees. If it's in you, you can... You can Poison someone else next to you. And you'll be accountable for what happens to them. See, we're planted in the house of the Lord. We're not planted in a podcast. You're not planted in a live stream. Experience. You're not planted in a parachurch ministry. We're flourish when we're planted in the house. And we're in the grove of trees that the Lord plants us in. That's the place where he's ordained the proper nutrients. See, I love palm trees. But if I try to bring a palm tree from Florida and put it on the front lawn of our church, I mean, we have our first winter. <laughs> it doesn't matter the excellence of the palm tree. It doesn't matter how much I spent on it. It doesn't matter how lovingly it was planted. It's not the right atmosphere. Not the right conditions for that tree to grow. Wow. So we grow in community in partnership with unbelievers. And we, uh, with believers, rather, other believers. We have to live accountably and transparently. Where we can develop friendships and relationships. Listen. And where people, when we do that, where people have the liberty to ask us some tough questions sometimes. Where have you been? We've missed you, haven't seen you. What have you been doing? Is everything all right? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, something in me just doesn't buy that. Tell me what's going on. Now, if you want to stiff arm the body of Christ and have no one in your life that can keep you honest and transparent and accountable, you'll do so to your own destruction at some point. 
Let's turn to one scripture. We'll do point four. Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. You guys okay? You don't have heat stroke, do you? All right, good. Okay, Hebrews 13, look at verse 17. All right, let's begin at verse 7. We'll read two verses. Verse 7 said, remember those who have the rule over you. This is spiritually. Who have spoken the word of the Lord to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. If Pastor Debbie and I and the other leaders uh, <clears throat> live this faith out before you and we try our best to model a good example then it's important that you're around us enough to notice that stuff. Because that's why we're, the Lord put us in the position that we're in. We didn't call ourselves to this. Been a whole lot of other things I would have called myself to. This would not have been high on my list. Verse 17 said, Obey those who have the rule over you. Same word now in the Greek. That means the spiritual authority. And be submissive. For they watch out for your souls. You know, that, that term, that phrase, be submissive, means to, to uh, willingly make your heart submit. It's not heavy-handedness. Submission is an attitude of the heart or the spirit. You can only be submissive if you choose to submit your life to my leadership. But that's what the Lord is saying that he wants. He said, and what they, they watch out for your souls, and I'll tell you, that's what we do. I, that's why I preach the way I do, because I know what's out there. And the Lord shows me some things, and I'm trying to blow the trumpet. And I'm trying to pour my heart out, because I've seen scores of believers backslide over, this, over the 40 years we've been serving the Lord. Scores. I mean, I would probably fill an ocean liner with people that never thought it would happen to them. Between that and divorces. Fill an ocean liner. On fire for Jesus today, six months from now, pff, in a bar. Shacked up with someone. So he said, obey those who have the rule. Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give an account. See, we're going to give an account for how we've led. For how we've watched over you. For what we've preached. It's either meat or Twinkies. I'm going to give an account for that. What kind of church do we build? Nonsense and bells and whistles and theatrical entertainment? Or did we compromise the gospel so not to offend anybody? Or did we do our best and plead with you to be, to get grounded and don't get culturally infected? And I'll tell you what, not every believer wants to hear this. I've had people get mad at me over the years because they don't want to hear this stuff. Or if I make mention of this or that or some piece of legislation, you're getting political. No, this is moral and biblical. I'm trying to tell you. Like I said a few months ago, if you have a child in a public school, you better be on top of what they're learning. You better be on top of what's being jammed down their throats. Look at this whole issue in Florida. Five years old. Five years old. They want to start telling kids about transgenderism? Over my dead body. Of course, not my dead body. It's Governor DeSantis. Thank God for him. Thank God for him. He won't be bullied around by that nonsense. Five years old? Should be still playing with dolls. You've got to be out of your cotton-picking mind. So devilish. Instead of preserving a child's innocence, they want to hijack their morals at five years old. It's the devil. You don't like that? Tough. And any teacher that goes along with that 
They're doing the devil's work, whether they mean to or not, and they better watch themselves. They're in a tough position, to be sure, but they better watch themselves. So he's saying here, let, please, live in such a way that I can carry out my responsibilities with joy and not with grief. Look at the last few words. Because if I have to carry it out with grief because you give me so many headaches, then I need a bottle of Excedrin. Then at the end of the day, when you stand before Christ, it's not going to be profitable for you. Because this is not my thing. This is his thing. I'm just an under-shepherd. I'm just trying to do my job. Don't let me make me walk into a propeller blade. So we want to grow wide. I'm sorry. No. you got to say, my roots are right here. I want you to understand something before, just before we go to point four. We have a spiritual enemy. Do you believe that? Yes. If you haven't met him, you will. And he will meet you. Just like this. You know what? He's not really threatened by the fact that we're excited about Jesus because excitement is like goosebumps. <laughs> He's really not all that threatened by the fact that we're excited about Jesus. He's not all that threatened about the fact that we're excited about the Bible. We're excited about the church. But he springs into action. When we say, I'm going to be planted. I'm not going to pop in and show up when I feel like it. No longer am I going to pop in when I feel like it. But you know what, honey? Let's get planted. Let's really commit like never before. Whoop! Oh, no. I got to stop them right there in that commitment. Uh-uh. Because that's how saplings become oak trees that I can no longer take down. So I want to poison them when they're a sapling. And I'll give them just enough arsenic as a sapling for them to self-delude and self-medicate and really believe they're oak trees when they're simply a sapling. That's self-deception. Knowing things intellectually from the Scripture, but having no ownership that changes your life in your spirit. You know what the scripture says, but it's not resident in your spirit as a tree. So you know it from an intellectual, intellectual Christianity, you'll be destroyed. In case you haven't noticed, spirits have been unleashed in the earth that are more violent, more rebellious, more you know, numerous than I've ever, ever, ever seen. And we're just beginning to enter the sorrows, the beginning of sorrows. Levi Lesko said, the church was never intended to be an audience, but to be an army. Amen. See, the devil gets mighty nervous when you start to grow roots. He'll give you two Bibles. Bibles don't give you roots. Your choices to commit give you roots. And without roots, you might as well just throw your Bible in the trunk of your car. See, Satan always tries to convince the plant that it really doesn't need to be planted. Satan says to the plant, look at yourself. You have leaves. You have little branches, don't you? Yeah, you know the lingo. You know the Christianese. You know that. Yeah, you don't have to be planted. Two of the best ways that Satan does that are excuses, like COVID and all this kind of stuff. And then guess what? He gets people, the second way he gets people in the hook in their jaw is to get them to mentally or spiritually devalue the soil that you've been planted in. If I devalue the soil that I've been planted in, first place that he starts is to Deceive me so that I don't see the ultimate value of what's right in front of me. Hello? In other words, I think I can, I can roll on any church, on any street corner in America and find a great church. As long as there's a cross on the steeple. 
See, that's devaluing where you are right now. And deception will not be far behind that. Let me talk about this thing called destination disease. In my view, this thing called destination disease, for example, this will keep somebody from being planted. Uh, daydreaming about Florida. With the idea is that the grass is always greener. It's some kind of paradise. Never fully, fully appreciating where you are and why. Because your mind is always divided and halfway somewhere else. Always grappling with a self-created, in my view, discontentment. I know I'm called to some great thing. I know I'm called to some great thing. Why can't I find it? All that's going to do is take this, take the, give you frustration day after day after day. It's going to get you nowhere. Don't you think? Hey, he's the one that called. If he's the one who called you to something, he'll make a way for that to happen. If it doesn't happen, you ain't called to it. <laughs> then just be the best that you can be at whatever you do today. That's what he's looking for anyhow. But you're driving yourself nuts and your mind's going to be divided. And you'll never be content. Or maybe you're like this with a destination disease. Spending 52 weeks out of the year daydreaming about two or three weeks vacation that you're going to have. Don't you think that's a little stupid? That means you're brain dead for at least 49 weeks. Do you really think that's going to do something really positive for you? You'll be, the, you'll be committed to nothing except the delusion that that vacation is going to somehow make, you, make up for the rest of your miserable year. You're miserable because you're living with a divided mind. And the Lord's saying, don't play that game because I will outlast you. I'm the everlasting father. There's only two ways to go in this kingdom, guys. You throw yourself on the rock and be broken to pieces, or the rock falls on you and grinds you to powder. There isn't a third option. I've chosen to throw myself on the rock. The rock is Jesus. Let's go to number four. We'll take one minute on this. The fourth thing. Fourth characteristic of a healthy tree is this. Healthy trees say, I'm sorry, number four. <laughs> healthy trees remain planted through every season. Healthy trees remain planted through every season. See, when a tree is healthy, it survives every season. It stays planted through every season. The seasons don't change its mind because it's a committed it's committed to its planting. Now listen, every tree, I'm sorry, every season is important to the, to the growth of both trees and to God's people. Now listen to this. The question will always be this. Number one, let me, let me rephrase. The question will not be, what season am I in now? But the question will always be, am I surrendering my current season to God? The question should not be, what season am I in now? So maybe I'll be happy, maybe I won't, maybe I'll be super committed, maybe I won't, maybe I'll be filled with joy, maybe not, maybe... What? It should not be, what season am I in now? It should always be, am I surrendering my current season to the Lord? So that he brings, he works all things together for my ultimate growth. I remember when the church was small and our kids were little, coming home from the office and doing different things. And I was still working a full-time job, as I said, early, early on. And I would come home and when our kids were little and, and Debbie would be like, <gasps> Oh, I'm so glad you're home. Oh, okay. Yeah, the kids were kind of crazy today, you know, that kind of thing. Parents, any time you have kids go crazy, a little 
like a crazy day? And uh, and so I'm so glad you're home. That always meant so you can take over. So I'm so glad you're home. I'm thinking, I'm not sure sure I am. (laughs) And I remember her saying, I didn't even get to brush my teeth today. (laughs) But see, she didn't quit that season. I didn't quit that season. We pressed through that season. It It was a season that we chose not to coast our way through. It was a season that we chose to love. Having the Lord show us that, man, there's going to come a day when you're going to pine away for those little memories. And all you want to do is get out of it. And I said, honey, we cannot do that. We will not do that because time goes by so quickly. I mean, before I turned around, they were in kindergarten. I turn around, they're coming out of eighth grade. Turn around, they're out of college, you know, high school and then college. What? Who did that? <laughs> are you surrendering your season to the Lord? What are you extracting out of it? Are you going through the motions? When is the last time the Lord spoke to you? When is the last time you discern? The still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Man, I can't even remember when. Then you have a problem. You're on fumes or you're choosing to go on autopilot because you know intellectually how things go. Listen, you don't come to church like this to try and get God off your back. Leave that for religion. You want to get God off your back? Go to a religious place on Christmas and Easter and give him visitation rights. But don't play that game with Jesus because the devil's going to take you out big time. Because when you come into a house that's glorifying Christ and teaching God's word, you're you're becoming a threat to the devil and you're announcing your intentions to align with Christ. And the devil will destroy you unless you get fully in with Christ. Because now you're huffing and puffing. Well, you better bring it. See, if you're a mom and you had the crazy times with the kids, that's why we have a mom's group. Because sometimes it takes a mom to reach a mom. So, I'll close with this thought. Never view your se- any season as a throwaway season. If you're single and you'd like to be married, don't view your singleness as a throwaway time in your life. As though your whole world's going to come together if you only get married. Well, let me ask you this. What happens if you get married to the wrong person? Boy, well, you're going to be begging for the days of singleness. If you feel like you're going to drag your, your mate and the things of God like an anchor, a millstone, congratulations. Your life is not on pause till you get married. And don't fall for the lie that what you do doesn't matter. What you do matters. You have gifts. You have talents that God has given you. He has saved your life. He's redeemed your soul. What are you doing with about offering your gifts and talents to the kingdom of God? What are you doing with that? Are you going to be like the guy that buried his talent in the ground? Who might God use you to impact today? Just think about that, all right? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this time that we've had. Thank you for this message. Lord, I pray that it challenged hearts. Lord, that we can grow and allow our roots to go down so much more deeply in you. Touch us this morning, Lord. Let us bear the fruit that you want us to bear. Let us be that... uh, that big tree, that oak tree, that the birds of the air can nest in our branches, that people can come and and we can encourage them as they come under the shade of the hope that we can bring them in Christ. Because the blazing heat of the sun of our times 
is making people weary and wearing them out. Help us be the dealers in hope that we can be. Hey, I'm Pastor Petey. And I'm Christina. Thanks for watching today. Let's stay connected. First, click the thumbs up on this video. Next, click subscribe. And lastly, click the Give Now link in the description to support the ministry so that we can continue reaching people all over the world. And if you're in the area, we'd like to personally invite you to join us right here in Middlefield, Connecticut and see for yourself what God is doing with our church family. Thanks again for watching.